So uh, let me just uh, do a little bit of an introduction for this session. I'm uh, Jonah Rockoff. I'm a professor here at the Business School, and, and I'm affiliated with the Social Enterprise Center. I do a lot of research on public education. And I'm just going to play uh, moderator here. I'm not going to give you any of the uh, serious substantive discussion, and I won't answer any questions that are difficult. That's for our, our panelists here. But let me just sort of lay out uh, some of the big questions that we hope to talk about uh, today, and I'll give you a brief introduction to who our speakers are. So we're here today to talk a lot about innovation and where innovation is taking place today in the education uh, sphere and in the education policy sphere. Um, and we're in a very special time, I think a lot of people agree we're a very special time for innovation uh, in educational entrepreneurship and also in education policy. There's a lot of support uh, on the political side, the regulatory side for change, and a lot of excitement uh, from lots of people uh, and sectors about how we can reform and improve uh, education. Uh, and a lot of that has come down to, to funding. Uh, and so one issue that our, our panelists will talk about a little bit is how do we think about the, the, the influence of, of funding and uh, from the federal government and other sources and how that's changed priorities and, and changed the landscape, if it has at all. Uh, and what are the big challenges that entrepreneurs face or innovators face uh, in developing their ideas, in scaling their ideas, and getting them off the ground and, and into practice and, and, and uh, influencing outcomes for, for kids and for uh, students. And, and the third thing which is really important in this, um, in this space is how do we define success? Um, Peter Blom, who uh, received the Bot Winning Prize today, talked a lot about the short term versus the long term and how in banking a big difference between his firm and what he sees in other uh, firms is taking a long term view. And I think that that's really hard in the education space because we have to really focus on the long, long term. If you're thinking about investing in a six-year-old, when are you going to see those returns? You're not going to see them until that person is out there in the labor market as a college graduate. And uh, as an investor, whether you be a, a, a nonprofit or a governmental organization, you may not even reap that return as an individual organization. You just reap it as a society. And how do we, uh, how do we measure success becomes very, very important in, the, in this case. So that's kind of the, a little bit of the lay of the land. Oh, and, and one other thing, of course, is not only uh, success in affecting lives, but also cost effectiveness, right? We'd love to everyone to have improved outcomes, but we also worry about costs. And how do we think about not just what are the best policies, but how much do they cost us? And what's the return on our investment? OK, so let me just give you uh, a brief introduction to our speakers. Um, sitting here to my left is Joel Rolls. He's the founder and CEO of the School of One which is embodied within the uh, New York City Department of Education. School of One was recognized as one of Time Magazine's top 50 ideas in 2009, and it was recently awarded one of the federal government's I-3 grants for innovation. School of One uses multiple instructional modalities to provide instruction that's personalized to students, okay? And it fits not only their academic needs, but also their interests and their learning styles. Sitting next to him is Jim Pizer. He's a managing partner at New Schools Venture Fund. It's a national nonprofit venture philanthropy firm. Seeks to transform public education. Um, Jim does a lot of things, but as part of his role with New Schools, he serves on the board of directors of Achievement First, New Schools for New Orleans, uh, Success Charter Network, and Uncommon Schools. And he's been a, a great influence on the education policy sphere in, in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, Kristen Kearns Jordan, the founder of Bronx Preparatory Charter School, which she directed from uh, 2000 through 2007. The Bronx, and she's still uh, affiliated with today, although she's not running it. Uh, Bronx Prep serves nearly 700 fifth through 12th grade students, and it sent uh, three cohorts of kids all on to college. And she's now a fellow uh, with um, a uh, fighting, uh, poverty fighting effort in Roxbury, Boston called Boston Rising, focusing on education and school reform strategy. And last, we have Lane McBride. He's a principal at the Washington, D.C. office of uh, BCG and a core member of their public sector practice area. He focuses on education, and his work primarily focused on strategy development and implementation of large-scale transformations, so statewide programs like Delaware's Vision uh, 2015, and Dallas Achieves, and Academic Transfer Transformation Plan in Cleveland. And he works on issues like organizational design, cost efficiency, and performance management within educational organizations. So 
we'll just proceed down the line and we'll hear from each of our speakers, uh, talk about their views on these issues, and then we're going to spend, try to maximize the time that we could spend with Q&A and have a, a substantive discussion with, with you all. So, Joel. Uh, thanks, Jonah. Uh, so, uh, I uh, oversee an initiative called School of One in uh, New York City. I came to the work um, as the chief executive of Human Capital, thinking that in education, um, it's all about getting a great teacher. Uh, <clears throat> and what um, I still believe that deeply, but what came to learn is, is that is both a window into the solution, meaning improve the quality of teachers, but a window into the problem, meaning if the only lever we have is, is the teacher side, um, that in itself is a problem. If you were on a plane and someone said to you, if you happen to have a good pilot, you'll make it to the other side of the country, you probably wouldn't feel too good about that flight. Uh, so School of One um, is, uses a number of what we call instructional modalities. Live teacher-led instruction, the kind of instruction that we're all familiar with when we think about what school is, is one way. It may be the best way, but it's just not the only way we know we can deliver instruction. We can deliver instruction with software, we can deliver instruction with virtual tutors, we can deliver instruction collaboratively. And so by integrating all of these modalities into one learning environment, that's what enables personalized learning. And to give you a visual for what this actually looks like, <clears throat> imagine in a middle school, uh, we've knocked down the walls between rooms 101 and 105 and have one large open space. In that space, there's eight or nine different stations with signs above them. Some stations are for live teacher-led instruction, some stations are for digital instruction, some for virtual tutoring, some for collaborative learning. And there's signs above those stations. We call them the Staten Island or, or Brooklyn or different, the Bronx Zoo, different landmarks. Students come in every day, they look up at the monitors, and there's monitors that you might, some of the monitors you see at the airport, and they see where they're supposed to go. And every day they go to their, they have two mini periods inside their math class. They go to their first period, maybe it's in the Bronx Zoo working online, and then the next period they work with live instruction in the Brooklyn space. Then they take an assessment, and then they go to the next class, whatever it happens to be. We then crunch the data, and depending on how they do, we create a schedule for them for the next day. If they did well, they move on. If they didn't do as well, they stay there and get more intense instruction. So it's a fully adaptive um, model. We are um, currently operating in three New York City schools, serving about 1,700 students. Uh, so one of the things we were lucky enough uh, to, that was lucky enough to happen while we were doing this is the federal government announced um, an initiative focused on innovation. We're, we're trying to catalyze innovation in education because uh, it ha it's not happening. And the reason it hasn't happened in education is because um, those that are the most natural innovators, which would be the publishers, um, don't want to cannibalize their existing publishing business. So they're not so quick to invest in digital technologies that may undermine their their existing businesses. School districts typically don't want to pay for it. Most of the money on the school district's budgets goes towards paying for teachers. We don't think to invest uh, in R&D. And the technology companies, um, by and large, view education as a vertical in which to sell their core products. Uh, so Apple, Google, they're not typically developing products just for education. They want you to buy more iPads or, or you know, more of their core products. So we're a big vertical for them, but we're just a vertical. Uh, so I think the, the federal government recognizes this. They, they um, uh, uh, instituted a grant in total of $650 million and invited uh, applicants from school districts and not-for-profits to apply. Um, we were the uh, fifth highest rated application. Uh, we are an early stage innovation, so we got the lowest tier of investment, which was $5 million. Those that are more established that have a, a longer track record of success were able to earn up to $50 million. Um, so we're off to the races with that. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there till the end here. <clears throat> Especially, you know, it's particularly problematic to have these glass buildings where you can see what it's like outside. So look this way, not that way, and, you, and you'll be fine. Um, so uh, New Schools Venture Fund, <coughs> for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, is a nonprofit grant-making organization, uh, in particular in our vernacular known as a venture philanthropy whose purpose is to support education entrepreneurs in service of transforming public education. Uh, we were started about 12 years ago. We've raised over that period about $180 million, of which we've invested probably about $150 million of it. Uh, and most of those investments have been in support of 
entrepreneurial organizations that are operating schools and in particular school networks, um, human capital organizations that are recruiting, developing, supporting teachers, um, and tools developers who are developing systems, platforms, and technologies that help those teachers and help schools be more productive and successful. So those are the sort of the three areas where we're concentrating our investment. Let me just um, tell you a little bit about one of them uh, to give you some sense for um, the, um, the impact of our investments. And I really <clears throat> should say it's the impact of the entrepreneurs who we support as opposed to our investments. Um, as, but to talk about that one sector, sector as a lead into a uh, somewhat broader conversation about how we think about um, measuring our own success as an investor and measuring the success of our portfolio. So the, the one part of this I want to talk about are charter management organizations. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with charter schools. Um, charter management organizations essentially are networks of charter schools, essentially an integrated network of charter schools. So you take one, typically one high performing charter school and then replicate it and build a network or a system of schools around that one original flagship school. Um, we now uh, are invested in essentially 17 or 18 of these organizations around the country. Together, they operate about 250 schools and serve over 85,000 students, all of whom are in low-income neighborhoods. Um, if you look at the performance of this portfolio of schools by <clears throat> looking at the statewide assessments, comparing the performance of these schools, in particular their low-income students, to low-income students in their host districts, these schools are outperforming those, uh, those students in those host districts by about 17 or 18 percentage points in both um, reading and math. Um, so if, and if you were to sort of look at this thing as a whole, both at scale and performance, essentially is probably, although these measures don't actually exist, the highest performing urban school district in the country. So that's a very sort of simple, straightforward story about our scale and our performance. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it masks a lot of complexity um, that you can quickly get to by scratching the surface. Uh, and I don't mean to at all denigrate the achievements of our network and our investments and the students who are in those schools, um, but it's a very complicated thing to evaluate the performance of a single school and certainly a network of schools across multiple states, serving different communities with different grade levels, with different areas of focus, and all the diversity that comes with a portfolio of schools. So um, we are, as an investor, often asked, asked all the time by the people who give us money. So we're an intermediary, so we raise money and then give it to others. Um, you know, why should we give you money? What is your impact? Um, and sometimes this is a, um, uh, a bit of a um, superficial question. So in other words, they want to hear a good answer, but it, does, it sort of doesn't matter what the answer is. And that's, I don't mean to be overly cynical about it, but. Um, in the previous session, who was in the um, social metrics session? All right, now I have to be careful what I say because I'll probably <clears throat> misinterpret um, what you all heard. But um, there was this dichotomy between storytelling and problem solving, and that the use of data was intended to you know, identify who the problem solvers were, in part as a counterbalance to the good storytellers who may actually not be good problem solvers. Um, and, and I think in some ways, um, new schools and the ventures we support are in the business about telling stories of problem solving. Um, and data is a way of telling those stories. Um, but we, we have to recognize the limitations of those, uh, of those data. Um, and that for a variety of reasons, and we can spend a lot of time on it, but you know, in the context of school measurement, there's a quality of assessment, there's comparability across states who are using different assessments, there's normalization for different populations that are being served, there are timeliness issues, there's limited scope of the assessments, they only test certain subjects, certain grade levels. Um, the schools themselves, when you try to roll data up, there's, you know, it's some are K-4, some are K-5, some are K-6, some are 6 eight, some are 5 eight. I mean, the complexity goes on and on. Um, however, <clears throat> I do think um, the, uh, in some ways we sort of put too much emphasis on trying to precisely get the data right. Um, I think in some ways this is both easier and harder than it looks. It's harder for all the reasons I just talked about. Um, it's easier because there are very successful schools that have the data to show it, um, that, are, that 
present evidence of it by um, fairly simple observational means so that identifying the winners or the high performers is actually not hard. Distinguishing, you know, who's the best, who's number three versus number two, that's, that's awfully hard. But in the end, that probably doesn't matter too much. Um, the other thing about our work before I close here is that we don't just invest in schools. So when we look at our portfolio, the data that I just um, gave to you was about one aspect of our portfolio. There are other aspects of it that are much more difficult to evaluate because they are about inputs into schools rather than schools themselves. Um, and so in those, what we're trying to look for are indicators that demonstrate their success in addressing the specific problem they're trying to solve, which means that when you look at our portfolio as a whole, you can't just sort of roll it all up into a single number and say our portfolio you know, produces a rate of return of 22%. It's more complicated than that and more differentiated than that. And that's actually, I think, a very good thing. Because from the entrepreneur's perspective, um, for them to be sort of harnessed to a single measure or a fairly simplistic set of measures makes it difficult for them to do what we want them to do, which is to innovate. And so developing uh, sort of personalized, customized measures is an important part of what we do. Um, the, um, the sort of the last thought uh, I'll leave you with is that in thinking about those measures, I think there are two levels of this. And uh, at the outset, you talked about long-term and short-term. I think another way, of perhaps, of thinking about it is there are benchmarks against, uh, there, there, there's performance measures against certain benchmarks that you might be able to identify because of external, um, external measures or other measures that are sort of out there, precise or otherwise. But there are ways to sort of specifically measure the performance of an organization against those benchmarks. But that answers the what question, but it doesn't answer the so what question. And so what is a lot harder. And from my perspective, what we're looking for in that is not the uh, sort of utopian measure that will actually tell us whether the work that we're doing is going to transform lives 10, 20 years down the road, but rather whether the measure, whether the organizations and the ventures that we support are meeting the objectives of our theory of action. So in, I think in order to have a meaningful so what measure, you have to have a theory for why what you're doing will matter in the end, and then measure against that theory, even though we don't know for sure whether that theory of action really is true. I'm going to do a different mode of instruction for you, but it links directly to what you've heard. All right. You get to do this. You have school A and you have school B. These are two middle charter schools. They're in the same neighborhood. They have the same demographics. Kids coming in. They're taking the same tests. Okay? You can even imagine that all of the same families apply to these two lotteries. Any, any thoughts? Which is the better school? <laughs>
does come at the end in terms of how many kids get to a proficiency level. And this is the retention. Staying in this particular school as opposed to transferring somewhere else? It's a great question. We don't really know where else is. But a lot of people, foundations, government actors, just kind of looked at fair statistics. And I'm going to give you a third one. This is 14 years later. 14 years after the fifth graders have arrived, you see that one school has 15% of their incoming fifth graders having achieved a BA. The other school has 35% of their students having achieved a BA. How do we pull all these things together? People don't really even track this for individual middle schools. Um, but I would argue that this is the rate, the ROI. If you had to figure out what do we want our schools to do, I think it's this. I think we want the A's. And the national statistic is 28% of Americans between 26 and 8 years old have a BA. If you are in the bottom quartile income line and neither parent went to college, you've got a 9% shot. And there's not that much data correlating the test scores there with this. Although one thinks that maybe that's predictive, there isn't a lot of data. We've become a lot more focused on this lately. I love accountability. I love high test scores. As a school operator, I worked very hard to get kids to high test scores. But as you're trying to figure out the impact of our reforms on schools, it's a deeply complicated measure. Okay, so they leave. Do they leave to go to the prep for prep program and do fantastic things? Or do they leave to go to a school with very high indicators of failure? It's, it's, and I say this simply to complicate the picture because I think as we scale up successful innovations, People are trying, you know, people at foundations, people at government uh, agencies are trying to figure out which is the number one, two, and three school. Um, and, it's, and the DOE makes it so easy. The Department of Education in New York, they give you a spreadsheet and you can sort it. Um, you can. Oh, it's terrible when you're looking at your own school, you're like, oh, jeez. But they don't put the retention figures next to it. So what kind of signals are our accountability measures actually sending to the educators? A parent of a low performer thinking of transferring out, is that the same conversation as a parent of a high performer thinking of transferring out? The data that are collected send signals to the actors in the field. And so I think as we are figuring out how to measure success of education, and I actually am very optimistic that there are innovations happening this decade that are finally breaking down um, some of the old assumptions. You know, Joel's program is very exciting. I, I, I'm a big believer in charters and in accountability. Um, but I think we're at a moment in time when we're, we're in danger of oversimplifying things. Um, the, the sort of general public, as we, you know, watch Waiting for Superman and other things, want a kind of very simple story about what's going on in education. And so my message to you, um, is be very, very critical readers. Ask what you're really seeking from our schools and are the, are the measures that we're asking for signaling to the educators what our society is expecting. And we can talk more about it in the Q&A, but I think it's a very exciting time. Um, and I think as we look at college persistence of some of these charters that have been um, sort of demonstrating some good results, we're hopefully going to find correlations between high test scores um, and college persistence. And if we don't, we need to work on, um, on what we do to address that. It's a constant loop toward the end, end game of having college graduates. Because I think there is, you know, if you're looking at return on investment, there is a, a clear indication that if you graduate from college, you have much better, you know, the, 
the unemployment rate now for college graduates is 5%. You know, in the, in the larger economy, it's, it's, it's almost <coughs> 10. Um, this country and others desperately need college-educated people. People need and deserve that college education. So how are our reforms getting us to that point? So I didn't bring any poster boards. <laughs> um, and, and as a consultant, I should really be ashamed of myself for not having brought anything in PowerPoint either. Um, but I wanted to talk just a little bit about, um, kind of go back to what Jonah said initially around this as a moment of opportunity for education, uh, particularly in, in this country. Um, one of the things that's happened with things like the Innovation Fund and the Race to the Top, um, billions of dollars towards, um, if not the cutting edge of innovation, uh, for all of it, for things like School of One, at least to scaling things that are relatively more innovative than what's happening in the majority of, of public schools. Um, so it's kind of what the education reform community uh, would have wanted over the past 25 years uh, of working on reform, but it's also this kind of uh, scary opportunity as well because what we're talking about is these things that are relatively more innovative now being put in the hands of uh, states and school districts that really aren't used to operating in a very innovative way. Um, and, and so uh, you had these uh, 12 states through Race to the Top getting billions of dollars to uh, do some things that are pretty foreign in a lot of cases. Um, so one of the things that we have an opportunity to do at BCG within our education work is to get to work with some of these states and school districts. And uh, I think we, we come at that at the beginning with a, a firm belief that change is possible in large, old, not very easy to change organizations. Uh, and we come at that from having worked with uh, large, not easy to change organizations for a long time uh, in, in the private sector and, and in the public sector. Um, and uh, there are a few different types of things that uh, I think are, are very important to make that change happen. And some of these we, we have the opportunity to, to work with uh, districts and states on. One of them is focus. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the race to the top is very exciting and also kind of scary. Because if you look at the scope of work for the implementation of race to the top in a lot of states, it's OK, we're going to do these 200 things. Um, that's a little bit scary. Uh, I think of a conversation we had uh, with a district a couple years ago where they said, you know, we've had this year-long effort. We've been really focused on narrowing down our strategic priorities. We have 30. And that was, that's a little bit scary. So one of the things that we, we, we try to do is, is help our clients to think about, um, uh, one of my current clients loves to say this, of all the things that we can do, what must we do? And it seems very simple. It's kind of management. 101, but I think it is really important and it gets lost in the sea of program this and program that. Uh, the next thing that ties to focus and having a real clear sense of your overall objectives is performance management. Um, so, and this I think ties with several of the comments so along the line here. Thinking about um, you have an end goal in mind, but what are all of the ways that you're going to measure uh, at intermediate steps? And so for uh, students, this is the whole uh, idea behind things like interim assessments where students aren't just taking a test at the end of the year but they're taking tests along the way but it, it works for uh, at other levels as well it applies to teachers when you're thinking uh, about having a culture of evaluations where teachers actually get meaningful feedback on how to do their jobs better um, and it applies to systems uh, so if you think uh, systemically and this gets over into the the measurement point a little bit um, I think in, often in school districts, there's a big uh, disconnect where there's the tests that measure outcomes, and either there's no measurement of the things that lead up to that, or there's measurement pretty far apart. So for example, uh, I am familiar with a district that's invested, and others have too, a, a lot in tracking attendance at professional development events. And so you track attendance at professional development events, you track student achievement. Well, there's a whole lot of steps in between. So. Um, it's not about getting it perfect, but are you uh, understanding whether uh, the participants feel like they had a good experience, they feel, feel like they learned something? Then are you looking to see, uh, did instructional practices actually change? 
So you're kind of walking down the path from the uh, attendance, the very minimal measure, and the ultimate measures of, of student outcomes. Um, a couple of other things that uh, I think we find important and we sometimes get to work with our clients on. One of them uh, is human capital, and you could talk all day about human capital, but I, I think there is a real need. Um, you know, most, uh, to, to say nothing of the classroom where it's critically important, even if you think about school districts and states and education, um, most are not as far along as uh, New York City in having the number of uh, very qualified people through traditional channels or through uh, MBAs or other kinds of talent pipelines into their uh, school districts to work on these problems. And so that, that's a critical uh, issue. And then the last one is, uh, at least the last one I've written down, uh, is participation. Um, a, a few years ago, one of the things that we worked on was a plan in the state of Delaware called Vision 2015, which was their grand plan for education that led into their race to the top application. But one of the things that we found that was most powerful about that experience, uh, they created this network of pilot schools. Uh, they called, called it the Vision Network. And the idea was that they were to implement the first, uh, be the first to implement some of the things that were in the plan. Uh, what happened uh, was they created this network that met on a regular basis that included CEOs from the business community, it included the Secretary of Education, it included the teachers union, it included superintendents, it included principals, teachers, uh, and, and ultimately even students. And they all talked about what was going on. So they were doing things and actually talking about it and having this vertical conversation throughout the state, uh, which seems like a pretty easy thing to do, but it's not something that had ever really happened there before. And I think it's something that they found to be uh, quite, quite powerful. So thinking about uh, the participatory aspect uh, of reform is also important as well. Okay, thanks to all of our speakers. So we have a good amount of time for <coughs> discussion with you all. So uh, please, if you have a, a question, just raise your hand. I've got some of my own, but I'd prefer to leave time to you also. Yes, and if you, if you, if you want to direct it to a specific speaker, feel free to do that. If you want to just direct it to the panel, that's okay too. Yeah, yeah, you. Can I take that first? And I'm sure others have, have a perspective on it. <clears throat> the, um, the the work th that which children demonstrate on the test, I think, has you know, in sort of education circles, been seen to be a pretty good validity. You know, the the, the tests are getting better and better. They um, they measure now writing skills. We're moving away, at least in New York and in other states too, away from the bubble test, more toward a writing skills and a problem solving test. Um, so they are getting better. Um, the danger that I see with an over-reliance on test scores is that if improperly led, there is a way to get kids to get good test scores very efficiently. Um, and it involves breaking it down, and here are the steps, A, B, C, D, E. Here's what you do, boom, 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 boom. Kids can become very reliant on adults to tell them exactly what they need to do to get to the answers of the questions. Um, at its worst, it can create a learned dependency on the adult figure um, that could counter um, encouragement of independent thinking, persistent self-reliance. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a kind of gross example that's coming to mind. Um, my son's oral hygiene. So he is eight years old and not so good on the oral hygiene. So I have always been on him. You know, brush the front, brush the back, brush the tops, you know, get in there and floss myself. 
He has perfect dental checkups, all is well. My husband and I, about six months ago, looked at each other and you know, if he went to summer camp, he would never unpack the toothbrush. Without me there, so we decided, you know what, we're gonna take a step back and we're gonna allow for a little bit more plaque to develop on the teeth because the kid needs to learn to be responsible for his own oral hygiene, and, and he is. Um, he asked me to get some of that act rinse stuff because he thinks it will freshen his mouth. I mean, you haven't met my son, but this is really a big development to ask for the act rinse stuff. But what it gets to is ownership, and, and if, if it is not at the same time encouraged for kids to really take ownership of their education, this danger lurks. Um, I don't think tests are bad. I don't want to be misinterpreted, but I do think the over-reliance on the one indicator can, in any indicator, frankly, you know, if we decide all we care about is retention, we'll just pat them on the heads until they graduate, and they won't, you know, you, 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 you sort of have to balance these different indicators, but there's not a terribly good um, indicator of, there's a lot of words, and we've talked about it before coming up here, grit, persistence, you know, pr it, these, People measure them through personality tests. It's not a terribly um, appealing way to measure a school's success to give you know, personality tests to all of the graduates. Um, but y y you know, any one factor to the exclusion of the other others presents a danger, in my view. Uh, so just, just to sort of add to that um, but from a slightly different perspective. As a system, um, there is, of course, a risk in going too far the other direction, the direction that Kristen's talking about. So I, I visited a classroom of a teacher that, statistically speaking, based on all of Jonah's metrics, is one of the worst teachers in New York City. She's in the fourth percentile. Um, and I walked into her class, and she said, well, I, I don't believe so much in these tests. I want kids to discover on their own. So they're drawing pictures of this, and I'm building their self-esteem, and I'm and I'm, I really want them to feel good about themselves. Uh, and, and we know from a mathematical point of view that she's not doing those students a particular service in that regard. So the tension we have is, on one hand, knowing that there's limitations to the assessments that Kristen Riceley points out. On the other hand, knowing that if we don't have some floor, some way to quantitatively measure what's happening, this kind of practice will continue to persist. So finding the right way of Accountably develop, account with accountability, develop some of these things that Kristen's talking about, I think is one of the big challenges for the next decade of school reform. I just throw one more thing in there, not to um, <clears throat> beat a dead horse, but um, one of the benefits of these assessments, <clears throat> these summative end of year assessments that states do and are required to do, um, is that they have um, really strengthened and maybe even created an assessment culture in education which um, some people recoil from, um, but others have embraced in a, in a very productive way through either uh, sort of periodic interim assessments, as Kristen was mentioning before, the kinds of assessments that go on in School of One, which are formative and daily, if not constant, um, because, and the, and the value here is not um, in order to draw the graph of school performance, but rather to know in a much more precise way who's getting it, who's not, so that they can get the attention and the, and the instruction that they need to be successful. And you know, we may very well, and Joel I think is very much on the leading edge of this, we may very well be at a point where we're kind of breaking through that, where assessment is not only um, in fact, but also in perception a tool of learning rather than a, you know, a, a bat with which to beat teachers. You, yes. Not 
So I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think that's ridiculous <clears throat> um, for two reasons. Um, one is that um, in certain, but New York City is a hard place to talk about this. Um, Newark, New Jersey might be an easier place, uh, or Boston, Massachusetts for that matter, where you can imagine quite easily scaling you know, a group of entrepreneurs and school operators to full district size. Um, so I, I mentioned the new school's portfolio is already 50% larger than Boston or Newark or Washington, D.C. <clears throat> the city of New Orleans um, has a charter sector that is currently enrolling more than 60% of the students within four or five years. It'll be over 80% of the students. So New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, yeah, that's, that may be um, sui generis. Um, in most other cases, um, through scaling, you can actually you know, capture market share, if you will, and change the system that way. The other thing, though, which I think is equally important, and what we've seen very much in New York, is that with transformative leadership at the top that embraces entrepreneurs and these, uh, and these, you know, these other sort of non-traditional school operators and providers, um, you can not only sort of bring them to larger scale and have a direct impact, but you can leverage that to have to drive reform through the system in a way that you couldn't without that sort of outside influence. I, I, I would agree, and um, I love your ecosystem language. Um, I use it too, and um, the work that we're doing in the Bronx and in um, the, with the foundation in Boston is very specifically neighborhood oriented. Um, partnering a charter school um, with a couple of other district schools, usually very closely proximate in, um, because there is a theory of change that involves, you know, an entire neighborhood surrounding the, you know, and supporting um, kids. And, and I think this is in part, um, at the beginning of the charter movement, everyone felt a little bunkered, you know, they're out to get me, they're out, you know, they're saying nasty things about the system, oh, they're out just to take our kids. And that is breaking down um, as sort of more and more forums are created where district teachers and charter teachers come together or leaders come together and we see ourselves as kind of a crazy quilt as opposed to, um, you know, two different sectors. I think that can be very healthy. You know, for example, we're talking, and I'm talking about in the Bronx now, um, with the public schools across the street about cross-registering for AP courses because, you know, we can run more if we have kids across the street coming back and forth and they do a really good global regions test prep class and so a little work on the part of the schedulers can make this kind of work happen um, and developing some sort of cross-school leadership, um, maybe, you know, the college tour bus that goes up to visit New England colleges has kids from you know, both schools is the work. That, so I, I think that's, you know, there are competitive effects that I think are very real. You know, you, you, you have a high performing school in the district and that makes people uncomfortable and, and encourages change. But there are also cooperative effects um, that can be very powerful too. And I think the latter are in greater mix now that I think the reformers are perceived to be a little less scary um, than we were 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, Andy. Um, so I, uh, I volunteer with this uh, fantastic organization called Minds of Matter. What they do is they take um, softwares, um, high achieving softwares from underprivileged backgrounds. They work with them for three years, help them graduate from college. Um, and it was sort of the, the whole recent theme of this organization is that the statistics show that kids from this kind of background have no problem getting into college. Colleges want these kinds of kids. They're, they've got diversity, they get great test scores, a lot of them even do well on SATs, but the studies show that overwhelmingly these kids do not graduate from college. So my question for, for the panelists is, what should the pool of education actually be doing? What could they be doing better to actually take these kids that are already uh, excelling to stay in school and actually help them get their degrees? All right, I got thoughts. Um, there's a great book, um, which I referred to the panel. I'm, I'm, I'm spacing out on the authors. Um, it's called Crossing the Finish Line, and it's all about this question of college persistence. Um, and looking at what, what indicators do predict persistence and which ones potentially don't. Um, there are needs for support at sort of both levels, at the high school level and even back to the middle school level and at the college level. One of the things that colleges have done is create more intimate communities for students, um, for all students, so that kids are not sort of 
out lost in the big system. Um, first time college goers might need more information or support um, just by virtue of their being the first in the family, or first in family college goers, I mean to say, just by virtue of their being the first um, there. Um, <laughs> very simple, good research on whether uh, financial aid is sustained over time. Um, a lot of financial aid is sort of uh, targeted to the first year because those statistics are published. Um, another way in which the way you're measured kind of drives behavior of organizations. Um, but I, I would argue that also at the high school level, opportunities for kids to have um, long engaging projects that require them to overcome obstacles. You know, instead of 10 simple um, assignments, one more complex assignments that might involve collab, one more complex assignment that might involve collaboration with other players. Um, would better prepare kids. I mean, frankly, the one thing that high schools, I think, should be doing um, is talking to their recent alums. What prepared you? What assignments prepared you? What, you know, what was useless? Talk to us. You know, give us the, the very you know, recent feedback. Um, high schools go after their alums for money. They don't go after their alums for information. Um, and they are a real font of, um, of information for their high schools. Well, I just um, quickly on that point, it's a little self-serving maybe, but there's an organization that we're uh, helping to incubate called Beyond 12, which is building a platform for doing exactly that. Um, because it is, it is one of the you know, missing pieces in the data feedback loop is, you know, when I got to college, was I well prepared? If not, why? And what were, my, what were the things that could have been addressed in high school? The only other thing I'll say, though, to your comment, which, which the question was about what can districts do, um, I think the first thing they ought to do is invest in organizations like that or Posse or others that are actually doing the work successfully now as opposed to saying, oh, okay, let's bring that in-house and let's try to do it ourselves. Not that they shouldn't do it, um, but execution is 90% of success and if someone is executing it well, you ought, to make, you ought to invest in them to do more rather than to sort of start fresh and risk the execution being weak. I would say that in the so a lot of the schools that are you know in these um, discussions are new schools and teacher retention is a significant challenge for new schools and at least in my personal experience um, stability in the teacher uh, community has been extremely important um, I, we don't track it as a metric um, do you track it as a metric uh, we don't I mean um, it, and we talked about doing it and consciously decided not to because of the perverse incentives associated with it um, because you actually don't want to retain bad teachers um, so it's the question is can we um, identify who the effective teachers are and then track the retention of them um, and we're, we're starting to make a little progress on that I think we're a long way away from doing it but I think until we get that kind of um, nuance in the measure, it's not going to tell us very much because some of the worst schools have some of the highest teacher retention numbers. Just stability of the organization, professional development, um, the teachers and a collaborative approach to solving problems at the school. Um, teachers don't want to be talked at and told what to do. Um, Management often has clear messages of what they need to do. It's the leadership skill of getting them to see that themselves um, that has been, and, and frankly, to add new ideas to, to the mix. But it, it, we find that teachers are satisfied when there's some predictability in a positive way um, because the school has established things that work. Um, not predictability of failure, but predictability of, of um, successful systems um, and a voice. A genuine voice and frankly that's that's to the good because as you develop the teacher voice as you develop the teacher leadership you have succession plans for the you know the leaders who um, who may burn out or who may start another school um, and so it, it creates at the same time that upward mobility that is a, a challenge in the teaching profession um, because you know 
there's a certain egalitarian sort of um, spirit to teaching. Each of us has our class, our group of kids, and yet you need opportunities for leadership development and teaching, and these kind of go hand in hand. Okay. Sure, yeah. Try to use this side of the room a little bit, too. Um, so I'm not actually uh, that knowledgeable about education, so I apologize for my question because it isn't as important as it should be. Um, but most of the time when I hear things discussed, I don't hear a lot about the parents. And so I guess my question about, um, about that would be two points. Um, one, to what extent can they be empowered to be involved or participate in education? And two, to what extent can they be used to maybe as another assessment of the teachers in addition to the test? So like, I can speak to the last part. I mean, th there are uh, districts and schools that do measure parent feedback. Generally, I, I don't know about as part of a teacher's evaluation. I think that might be pushing a, a bit beyond, but there are districts that do track uh, general satisfaction. You do have the problem there uh, that people tend to want to think that their kid goes to a good school. And so it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to manage, but it is something that's tracked. And I think as a broader portfolio of things that you would measure, um, it, it's something that makes sense to, to measure. <clears throat> I'd add in, in, our, in our particular model, um, uh, we're trying to empower, empower parents more with information. So typically what happens, which has happened since we were in school, is you, know, you say, you know, here's my, here's my math test, mom, I got a C in fractions. She's, oh, let me help you with this. Oh, we're already on to decimals. Parents are constantly getting lagging information about student performance, and it's just sort of the nature of how can a teacher possibly tell every parent of every kid what's happening right now. Um, in our model, because of the, the way that the, the, the technology works, parents will have a window into what is my child learning tomorrow? How did he do on the assessment at the end of the day? What content did he have? So now I can think about why is it every time he goes to Mr. Jones, he's not passing the assessment? And then lastly, is there content that I can access as a parent that is completely aligned to what my child is studying that I can work on together with my child in advance? And I think we haven't rolled all that out yet, but as we roll that out, I think it will give parents interesting window into what's happening in classrooms that now they just don't have both physically but also metaphorically because of, of the sort of challenges of getting information in that way. Um, go to the, all the way to the back with the glasses down. Uh, if you listen to the AFT, charter schools have no <coughs> uh, If you look at the Huxby report, there's positive impact. <laughs> Mind of all the data and research out there, what is your opinion of the true situation? That's all you can. So the truth is it's a mixed bag. <clears throat> and uh, I could, you know, if there was a whiteboard here or something, I could draw for you a curve of um, public school performance, um, you know, bell curve distribution. And uh, Unfortunately, what you see in the charter sector is the same curve, and maybe it's a little bit to the right, or maybe it's a little bit to the left, or maybe it's right on top. I, I don't know, and in some, at some level, I don't care. Um, because although it would be nice to think that you could start an entire sector and have all the schools be great, that's not going to be the case. The, the question, there, there's sort of two questions, I think, or two um, factors here. One is that the charter sector is creating new high-performing schools that would not have existed otherwise. So we're adding to the stock of high-performing schools. Um, so that's like full stop. Um, the second is more of a policy question, um, which is that in, especially in, in this, or I should say specifically in the charter sector, the people who authorize charter schools, so they're the ones, they're like the, you know, the school committee for charter schools, um, are not doing nearly enough on the front end to evaluate the quality of the people who are coming forward proposing new schools, nor are they being nearly strong enough on the back to hold them accountable for results because the, the theory and in some, in some places the practice of charter schools is that low performing schools close. And if you actually were able to do that, if authorizers had the capacity and insight and courage to do that, um, you would see that curve, that bell curve gradually moving further and further to the right. 
Um, we aren't there yet, so, but I think it's an authorizer, it's an authorizer and policy issue. Um, but by the same token, again, I think the number of high-performing schools in the charter sector is growing at a f much faster rate than in the, in the district sector. Yes, you, uh, yes. an interesting statistic um, and this is the students perceptions themselves but I think it, it probably is representative of whole families um, <clears throat> 30 years ago there was a poll done of 10th graders nationally how many expected to get um, a bachelor's degree it was of, of sorry of low-income um, students and 22% um, answered that they did 30 years later in 2010 um, 66% responded that they expected to get a bachelor's. So there has been, and, and I think that, that tr I see that trend with parents, just anecdotally, the, at least at the sort of very basic level, um, a college degree is important. I need this to be successful. I need my child to get this to be successful. It has taken a dramatic leap forward in the last 30 years. However, we, have a problem of systems, frankly, schools, um, both at the K to 12 and the college level, not really knowing how and consistently delivering on that promise. Um, and I also think there is the, um, when financial aid runs dry or when there is a major problem, um, it, kids do need support to get through that. And to go back to my, my last answer, um, there, there is a need for encouragement um, and access to mentorship, I think, is, is a big um, one of the ways that this can be addressed. And so while there's, while there's a stated belief in education, helping families to navigate, because frankly, going to college is a lot harder when you're poor, um, when you have to work um, many more hours than if your family is affluent and paying your whole tuition, um, when you're doing something that not everybody in your family can necessarily talk about, very specific way um, where you may be coming from a high school that has not as well prepared you as um, some other kids in you so so it's a harder task um, and so th th we all collectively need to develop greater support systems for people to make it work Wait for that. 
Even though I'm not a panelist, can I just say that New York City does have an innovative program that uses uh, meal time in two ways. A, they push healthy food, and there's been a very concerted effort, I think, from the NYC DOE to make sure those meals are healthy. But also, they're using that time productively. So kids get into school early to eat breakfast. Um, and it used to be that they would just, you know, there'd be some kind of you know, food distribution mechanism that gives us there and they eat and they do nothing else. Now everything is prepared well in advance. It's all boxed and prepared so that kids don't, it doesn't take very long to serve the food. And kids sit at desks and they actually have, to, they do a learning activity and teachers are there on staff, not just sort of cafeteria workers. So there, I think that um, it could be a, a problem in the way you su to suggest, but I think that um, at least some people are innovating and saying, wait, this is valuable time that we ought to be using. Uh, and, and a moment to be furthering other goals, not just uh, a cost. One other quick self-serving comment. We're um, a, a, an investor in a, in a company called Revolution Foods, um, <clears throat> which is uh, providing healthy meals um, uh, using you know, local produce and local, um, and local, um, local products generally, and um, delivering them every day to schools. Uh, they're mostly, at least originally in Northern California, they're now getting in Chicago and other places. Um, it's a for-profit company. Um, they're growing by leaps and bounds. They started out in the charter sector. They're now breaking into the district sector. There, there's it, there's an education component too to the the sort of approach to food and eating that I think is very powerful. There's a, it, there's a um, a blog on at the Huffington Post. A teacher named Kate Corfort wrote one of the best pieces on. Um, how she has engaged her students in a conversation about what they eat. And it's very funny, so I would encourage you to go to that because it's not simply what's presented to kids, but it's the way in which that conversation about health and, um, and your body and energy, and, and, and you know, she goes all the way to sort of food justice is what she calls it and how we, you know, how we grow our food. And, and, and it, it, it's actually a very powerful educational tool, the whole conversation around food, because we all do it. We all eat three or four or five times a day. And so it is immediately relevant. You, know, you, you don't have to kind of create simulations to make it real and relevant for kids. It, you know, it's going on all the time. So it's, it's, it's actually a great tool for the long, sustained, engaging projects that build that critical thinking. OK, I'm going to take w one last question, and then we're going to have to uh, wrap up. We're all, already a little over time. So uh, sorry, go down. <laughs> So a couple of answers. One on, on, on the sort of question of can you, can you be an effective teacher with a summer crush course, there's actually a great study done by the man sitting next to me on this exact question in New York City uh, uh, and did find, if I'm not mistaken, um, that those that were alternatively certified performed as well as other first year teachers and in some cases even somewhat, somewhat better. So um, that at least is one study that, that, that I get that pretty much right. <laughs> um, but that said, I think there's a larger issue that, that you bring up, which, which, which is the professionalization of, of teaching. Um, it, this is an incredibly difficult job. Nearly half of all teachers we hire in this country are gone five years later. The latest survey uh, that was conducted by Edweek found that 40% of teachers today consider themselves disheartened. 
Um, and think about half of all teachers leaving the profession in five years with an incredibly generous pension at the end of that rainbow, and they're still leaving the profession. So one of the most important things we can do is recognize that this existing model of one teacher, 28 kids in a box, isn't working for kids, and it isn't working for teachers. We've got to figure out ways to leverage their talents more and make this job more sustainable. We cannot simply just hire and fire our way into the kinds of education that we need for our children. Okay. Are you sorry, you I think it is important just to link that issue with some of the broader things that are going on around teacher evaluation and development. Um, one of the things that we found really powerful, um, BCG's been involved in a project in Victoria and Australia around developing a performance and development culture in schools. And one of the uh, things that you find in doing that is that by doing that, you actually get a higher level of satisfaction with the job. So that actually, I think, ties back to some of the specific reforms uh, that are happening if you look at them holistically and not just we're talking about pay, we're talking about evaluation and all these things disparately. Okay, thanks everyone for very good questions and a great discussion. Let's thank our panelists.